Great, thank you all for joining us. Good morning. My name is Rochelle Tregueros. So we're going to get started now. Thank you for joining us for the sixth um, installment of our Bay Area Impact COVID-19 webinar series, where we speak with business leaders, um, experts, policymakers, and others um, to discuss the wide-ranging impacts that this global pandemic is having. Uh, today, we have two illustrious guests, Congresswoman Jackie Speer and Small Business Administration Regional Director Julie Klaus. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to have uh, Representative Speer back today um, after she joined us briefly two weeks ago to discuss CARES and specifically the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we're really excited to speak with you again today and get into, um, get into the topic a little more deeply. Um, Congresswoman Spear represents the California's 14th Congressional District, with sp which spans from um, Southern San Francisco through San Mateo County to East Palo Alto. Um, she serves on a number of critical committees, um, including um, those focused on the military, on government um, oversight, as well as um, she being a very major champion of women's rights. Um, prior to being elected to Congress, you also served as a San Mateo County um, Supervisor and in both the California Assembly and Senate. I also have to say that I read your autobiography, which is an incredible story that I really recommend to everyone interested on this webinar. Um, finally, we want to thank you for your leadership on both the CARES Act, um, as well as you and your office working with the Bay Area Council staff on the 501c4 issue on the Paycheck Protection Program. Thank you for joining us. We're also thrilled to be joined today by Julie Klaus, the Small Business Administration's Regional Director um, Julie is the district director of the SBA's San Francisco district office, where she oversees the delivery of SBA programs and services for 14 counties in Northern California. Prior to San Francisco, she was the deputy district director of SBA's Washington metro area office, overseeing the largest 8A portfolio in the country. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. So to kick us off, um, I'm going to tee up um, a couple opening questions for our great panelists, but we wanna spend the majority of time with you, the audience. So please get started typing in your questions in the Q&A box that you'll see below at the screen. And if you want us to recognize your company, please go ahead and type that in as well. We want to get to as many questions as possible we might not be able to answer all the questions, um, but we'll do our best. So to get us started, why don't I turn it over to Congresswoman Spear, and um, could you just talk a little bit about what happened with the first two stages of funding that we've seen in the CARES Paycheck, with the CARES Paycheck Protection Program and where we are right now in the process? Uh, thank you, Michelle. It's good to be with all of you. And I'm so grateful to Julie for joining us today because this was one of the do outs of our last meeting together. Uh, at the time, you also indicated to me um, your interest in wanting to make sure 501c4s and c6s were um, able to participate in the program. I've had a number of conversations with the speaker about it. She gets it. Um, we weren't successful in getting it into um, the second version of uh, CARES. We're not calling it CARES 2 because CARES 2 is yet another um, program that we're going to probably roll out after we go back into session for cities and counties. But um, I want to make sure that you have all the time you can with um, Julie, who is an expert on this. We clearly were not um, prepared for the amount of um, demand 
in CARES One for the PPP and the idle loans. Uh, we have now augmented it, it's over $670 billion. Uh, there are some, and I'm one of them, that thinks we may have to increase it even more, but um, we hopefully have um, ironed out some of the kinks that were in the original program and that you're gonna be able to access uh, the money through your local banks. Um, I'm certainly hearing from constituents uh, throughout my district that the loans are starting to flow and um, frankly even nonprofits are getting money now. So um, Julie, I know this has been a Herculean task and I want to commend you for always being accessible uh, to talk to small business owners and to be on calls like this one. So Rochelle, I think at that uh, I will um, toss it back to you. Julie's on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I said, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> I was muted. Um, Julie, so I'm going to toss it back over to you. Could you describe a bit about what these two um, stages of funding looked like? What's the difference between the two stages um, and what your on the ground experience was? Sure. So there's um, a lot that we learned from the first uh, wave, if you will, uh, with the PPP funds, uh, and the second wave um, has opened, as you have, I think everybody knows, yesterday. So I find it, um, you know, there's a lot of frustrations, there was a lot of interest, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of mixed messaging. Um, so again, thank you to uh, Congresswoman Spear and to the Bay Council for giving this forum to kind of um, provide some additional information and steer people towards the resources that are, are providing the guidance documentation for this program. Um, it is obviously a brand new program and as much as I think this analogy is overused, it's also the most appropriate one I can think of. We were literally building this airplane while we're flying it. So it certainly wasn't a perfect process, still isn't, but it, the money is actually getting out there. Um, we look at the data from the first wave. It's really interesting is that the, um, the average, most of the people that applied for the program is over 1.2 million received 1.6 million total, but the 1.2 million um, received loans of 150,000 or less. So there is an argument that the smaller businesses were actually in the pipeline and were getting the funding. Um, there also were the smaller banks even were the majority of the lenders in this situation as well. So it's really um, nice to see that, that that happened. We had a lot of community banks that really threw, I think literally every, every resource they had at this, knowing that they wanted to support their local businesses to the extent that they were able to do so. And uh, we saw that when we look at the final numbers. Um, it's still not a perfect process and we're still working on it. Um, one of the things that we've done is to try to onboard new lenders. These are banks that maybe never participated with SBA before, or maybe they did, but they haven't done it in a really long time. So we're kind of bringing them back into the fold, so to speak. So there's been upwards of nearly 600 new lenders brought on board, and that includes a lot of credit unions and some uh, you know, non-bank non lenders as well, some of the FinTech lenders. And what we hope this does is create more opportunities, more resources for businesses to tap into if they were having any particular issues with the first lender maybe that they tried to work with. So there's trying to create more resources, create a bigger pipeline. Uh, we now have over 5,000 banks that are eligible to offer PPP loans. Um, and to help Northern California businesses, we've kind of broken it down into a list um, that we can provide to people, uh, the banks that we know of um, that are participating. And again, we add um, SBA just added two new banks in our area, two new credit unions actually um, this week. So we're literally every day we're updating that list as well. Um, the second wave, I think, you know, the, the banks and the community was a little bit more prepared because they saw what happened the first time through. So um, as you can imagine, yesterday um, they had announced on Friday that the, the, the 
program would be reopened at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, 7.30 for those of us out here, and the banking community was ready, and there was a massive um, rush to go and enter loans, which uh, clearly slowed everything down. It was, I think, uh, not unexpected, but they are moving through. Um, we saw that the uh, SBA administrator tweeted out yesterday that as of, I think it was like 3.30 p.m. Eastern time, we had over um, 100,000 loans that had been submitted. Uh, and again, a large majority of those were from the smaller banks, the banks with the asset value of, of 10 billion or less. So, and it was over 4,000 banks that actually um, had submitted loans. So we're definitely getting um, people from all over the country, all the different banks participating and trying to get those loans into the system. Um, as quickly as possible. So um, before uh, we turn over, I did want to also provide another quick update just so people have the information and this might um, alleviate some of the questions or answer some of the questions too. The uh, IDO program, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and then the, the enhancement of that, the IDO Advance, which was that advance of up to $10,000. Uh, those programs, people will note the Applications did shut down last week also for those programs. And that was again because we ran into an appropriation cap. Um, but more funds have been appropriated to this program, both of these, um, both parts of the IDLE program. So we do expect that that application is going to be reposted again this week to accept new applications. If you had already submitted your application prior to uh, it being uh, the application being taken offline, so that was prior to April 16th, your application continues to be processed. So it's in the queue, it's in the line for processing. You, you do not have to reapply when we open the new um, application or open the application back up. Um, it is continuing to be processed. Um, the funding is continually, um, the loans are approved on a continual basis and the funding is dispersed on a continual basis. So I'm telling businesses, um, what we've learned is that the idle advance money that's at up to 10,000 is being directly deposited into the bank account that you designated on your application. Uh, so that's, that's how you'll know when you get the idle advance. The actual loan, the idle loan is um, a document you'll get messaged by SBA through email, uh, giving you a link to go into a portal to collect your closing documents and to sign off on them. So Julie, uh, is the, when we first opened up Idle, uh, it was $10,000, and then it was uh, redefined uh, as up to $10,000, and most people were only getting $1,000. What are most people getting now? Uh, the calculation they're using is $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. So if you're a sole proprietor or just self-employed um, and it's just you, you would get the $1,000, but you can get an additional $1,000 for every employee. And that is a grant? Yes, that, that is, yeah, that's the forgivable loan. And regardless of what happens with the rest of your idle application, even if it's declined for any reason, you never have to pay that back. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so that program, like I said, it, it, your application is still being processed and uh, you don't have to, to reapply. Uh, the third thing I would do want to let people know about is because it is open and active right now. And I think it's a huge advantage and I, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't gotten its own set of media coverage. But the, as a result of the CARES Act, there's also the SBA debt relief program. And this is where SBA is paying six months of principal and interest on existing, uh, as long as it's you know not in liquidation status, but existing SBA debt, whether you have a 7A loan, a 504, or a micro loan. So existing debt can get six months of interest and principal paid by SBA. So the best way to make sure you're enrolled in this program is to talk to your lender. The lender has the guidance and information on what they're supposed to do in order to kind of quote enroll you in this program so that we will pay, SBA will end up paying the lender directly. Um, so you as the borrower don't have to do any additional paperwork, um, but I would check in with your lender and make sure that they've got you enrolled, so to speak, into this program so that you can take advantage of this benefit as well. So those are quick updates. Great, thank you so much, Julie. And um, 
you know, it sounds like there's just so many different programs and services. And, you know, what we really saw with the first tranche of um, funding was it was widely scrutinized for, you know, who was able to access these loans with um, the smallest businesses that we saw um, having a lot more challenges, maybe because, you know, everything is um, so complicated. There's so many different programs. Um, among other reasons. But could you talk a little bit more about what was done the second round to combat against that and really help out uh, the smallest businesses um, navigate the system? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing was encouraging businesses to get uh, uh, tap into our free business advising services, whether it's with the SBDC, SCORE, Women's Business Center. Um, I can talk, you know, specifically the SBDC network in Northern California really ramped up. They actually hired additional consultants to try to work with businesses. Because I think one of the really important things for any business to do is to do an assessment first. See, like, what actually, what kinds of business expenses do I have? Where is my greatest need? What are, what are the things I need to pay? What bills do I need to pay today and for the next couple of months? And when you figure out what that looks like, that can help you decide which program or combination of programs is best for your business. So it sounds very basic and simple, but I think um, actually going through the exercise of putting down on paper what your expenses are, where they're categorized, can really help you then figure out which program, what kind of benefit you might receive under, whether it's idle or PPP, or looking at you know local, a lot of local jurisdictions, cities and counties also came up with loan funds um, to see which of these best suit your needs or a combination thereof if you're able to combine them in a way that doesn't duplicate um, resources. So the simple exercise was something I really strongly encourage businesses when we had the, you know, the brief down period, if you will, in between um, when the funding ran out and before we got the new funding. And I think that that's the way to help you start having these conversations by having the data in front of you and working with advisor because it's free free resources for you to help you figure out the best decisions for your business. And then the step that these advisors can do is also help connect you with the right resources, whether it be banks, maybe helping you find a new lender if you need to, or if it's through some of the other resources, even California iBank, which opened up um, its program this past week too. So there's lots of different uh, channels out there for people to uh, explore and see what's best for them. Julie, how much did PayPal, what, what percentage of the market did PayPal pick up? Uh, that I don't know. Unfortunately, I haven't seen the data broken out by lender. Um, I just have it by uh, size of the loans and geography by state. So okay. I'm sure, I'm sure the data breakouts are coming. I just haven't seen them yet. Thank you. I want to get back to that data question, but first let me turn it over to Congresswoman Spear and hear from you and your perspective on some of the lessons learned with that first tranche of funding um, and how this new um, $310 billion is being allocated differently. Rochelle, I actually would much rather um, have that conversation later. Let's get to questions from uh, members of the council because I want to make sure we use our time uh, appropriately. So yeah, I, I, we can do a post-mortem um, on what we should have done differently at another time. Of course. So one of um, the big questions that our, our members are asking are around specific um, issue areas. So um, namely um, higher education. Will more, will more funding be allocated um, for higher education? This is um, written by Francis Johnson. We also have um, a question about transportation funding by Sarah Rashid. So what about these um, specific issue areas? Well, our next focus is going to be on states and local governments. And um, after we fund that, then we will look at um, a massive infrastructure bill. I can't speak to the universities yet, but I know that they will be considered at some point, but they're not in the queue as the next two. Great. So a couple of the other, or, uh, Julie, do you have any anything to add to those? For specific um, 
not, I, I don't have any insight on anything specifically. Um, you know, the, the conversation has been at the state or municipal level, of course, the SBA funding um, can't support state and municipal governments. But if there's, if there's uh, businesses that are uh, supporting any of these efforts um, as vendors or contractors, or um, if it's a nonprofit, you know, some nonprofits in the educational space may have also been eligible for some of our programs too. So depending on um, what, their, what role somebody is playing and if they're a small business and or a nonprofit, they might be able to tap into the current programs. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, then I want, want to turn it over to some of the questions around process from our members. Um, so Estelle Davis asks, is there a possibility that the PPP forgivable time period will be extended beyond eight weeks, considering the ongoing impact of COVID-19 related closures? I think that's a question for me more than Julie. Yes. And I think that there is a, uh, I'd say 50-50 right now, but I think there's a growing recognition that uh, we are not going to be prepared um, to go back to the old normal in, in eight weeks. So, um, but we have not yet included that in any bill, but it, it's a 50-50, I could um, conceive of that happening. Great. So I, another um, question around process for you, Congresswoman. Um, how is the House ensuring oversight on where the money is going? Well, that's a very good question. And um, I've been somewhat outspoken, and Julie's probably aware of this, that uh, California uh, was treated, I think, unfairly, and particularly in the first numbers. Uh, Texas was receiving over a billion dollars more in loans, and I believe um, 30,000 more individual loans. Now, those numbers changed later, but generally speaking, a lot of smaller states, and, and, and whether it was by accident or not, um, red states got 60 to 80% of the loans that they requested. Um, this is not something I think Julie can necessarily answer, but I do think it's going to require oversight um, by the uh, Oversight Committee, of which I'm a member in the House. And unfortunately, and maybe Julie can respond to this, I don't know how these loans have become public. Uh, for instance, the LA Lakers were um, identified as having received $4 million in loan dollars, and now they're returning it uh, because it became public. These loans are not public, it's my understanding. Is that correct, Julie? Uh they, to my knowledge, they have not been made public yet, um, and I don't know if any you know, certain aspects of loan data can be obtained under FOIA. Uh, is, but I don't. I'm not aware if there's been a massive FOIA request or anything yet. I know from the agency's perspective, I haven't seen us release indivi any individual loan data. So how how did Ruth, Chris, and Shake Shack and uh, these others get identified then? through leaks? But, um, potentially, or maybe they self-disclose to the public, I'm not sure. I think with some of the publicly traded companies, they had to do an SEC filing, I believe. That's probably where it came from. And now, uh, for all of those of you who are listening in, Steve Mnuchin has uh, basically sent out uh, a guidance to any um, publicly traded company that they should return the money because they really do have access to capital in other ways so that this money can in fact go uh, be stretched longer. Is that correct, Julie? Yeah, I mean, it's our intent. We, you know, the, we typically in the normal lending world have this standard called credit available elsewhere, which is why normally publicly traded companies um, are not eligible for our programs. Uh, in this particular, for PPP purposes, that requirement was waived. Uh, but I think the intent still is there, and we would strongly encourage yeah, businesses that have uh, alternate means of getting funding or other channels of resources that they do explore those so that we can, you know, reserve or save the funds um, for the smaller businesses who might not have that, those kinds of resources available to them. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting that I didn't even realize, when you add any employer with 500 employees or less 
plus the specific categories that are set aside based on um, different kinds of industries. And you add on the fact that if you are an employer but have different uh, units, different franchises, different locations, you can have up to 500 at each location. The number of employers that become eligible for this program is close to 97%. Is that correct, Julie? Right, there were some, um, there were different ways that people could qualify, business could qualify. There was our normal size standard, which is either revenue or based or employee based, depending on your industry. Um, then we added, um, the CARES Act also added nonprofits, which is normally not a, a group that's eligible for SBA loans and, and had the cap of 500 employees or size standard. And then there was the additional um, creation of, or waiver, depending I guess how you want to look at it, of some of our size standard rules when it came to, came to food and hospitality industry um, so that franchisees who had multiple locations, but again, like you said, less than 500 in each location, could still qualify uh, under this program. So there were a couple enhancements made um, per the CARES Act that were uh, not part of our normal 7A lending program environment, which I think uh, added, added additional, um, created additional eligibility, but then also created a, a lot of additional um, confusion as well, I think. Great. Um, Representative Spear, um, I wanted to turn it over to you. You mentioned um, CARES 2 would likely um, be another bill perhaps down the road. And you mentioned about how so many um, businesses and nonprofits already qualify under the current criteria. And the need is just so great. And we saw an overwhelming response of um, of need from um, different businesses and nonprofits. Um, and again, we want to thank you for everything that you've done to try to um, push the 501c4 issue. For those of you on the webinar, the Bay Area Council is a 501c4 organization, so we don't actually meet the criteria um, to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, but we're doing everything that we can to maybe open up those criteria. And so my question for you, Representative, would be um, what other types of organizations or um, businesses might we see open up? And is that something that we're seeing on the horizon? So I think we're going to have to look at other industries in particular. Um, I met with the hospitality industry last week by Zoom, both for San Francisco and San Mateo counties and they have been hit exceedingly hard. So uh, again, I, I met with the speaker um, by phone and talked about how we address that. Uh, the restaurants in San Francisco, as many as 30 to 50% of them may not reopen. So uh, we need to look at other ways of uh, trying to um, provide a lifeline uh, to these small and larger businesses. I think the, in the automobile industry is going to be very hard hit. I think it already has been. We could basically um, lose over a million jobs if we don't find some way to stimulate uh, the purchase of new cars. Um, I think uh, J.D. Powers has suggested normally we have 17 million cars that are purchased each year, uh, it may be as low as 7 million. So you can imagine how, um, how profound that effect will be on those automotive um, industries and those companies. So um, we're looking at ways to create a stimulus, um, something like ca cash for clunkers, but without the, the downside elements of that particular program, something to stimulate electric vehicles, so um, that's the kind of efforts that we'll see coming down the pike um, over the next few months, I believe. Great, thank you. So speaking of specific industries, um, we have a question from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory from Don Medley. Um, Congresswoman Spear, thank you for all you do in Congress, especially for science and innovation during this particular crisis, uh, but in a sustained way. 
Are you satisfied that the federal response with this federal response to date is fully leveraging our nation's scientific resources, academia, national labs, industry in a coordinated and efficient way? In your opinion, should more be done? So a very good question and the answer very simply is no. Uh, before our call, I was on a call with the House uh, Intelligence Committee uh, and with the former intelligence directors uh, that are obviously no longer there. And it was um, very chilling to realize that we have prepared all these decades from a national security perspective in terms of arms and um, have not focused on cyber and frankly have um, undermined the health and science component for a good length of time. So this pandemic has brought us to our knees like no other war has brought us to our knees with the exception probably of World War II. And we're closely um, tracking the percentage of unemployed. In the Great Depression, it was about 25%. We're almost at 20% now. So I think that um, public health in particular is going to be um, front and center as we move forward. Um, one of the things we talked about was making sure we had health attaches in all of our embassies because that would have prepared us better to know what was happening on the ground in China. You may recall that the uh, Chinese premier actually uh, cut out all of the Western journalists about a month before the pandemic occurred. And that probably um, had something to do with the fact that we did not hear about it as soon as we could. But even when we did hear about it, once the genome was actually um, uh, determined and made public, that was in early to mid-January. And you know, we, there were steps we didn't take, and in part it was because the scientific community was not relied on. It was um, more of a political decision that was made. So um, I hope we, we have learned some very um, potent lessons. And I'm sure there's going to be a commission created on a number of levels. There's a couple already in Congress, but much like there was a 9-11 commission, I believe we will probably create another one um, on the pandemic. We have got to prepare now for the next pandemic. Um, and I think we have all learned a very um, horrific lesson and we now have 50,000 Americans dead and over a million almost Americans who've contracted the virus. So um, I hope yeah. that answers your question. Yeah, it's um, really a sobering and scary, obviously uncertain time. And hand in hand with the health impacts that this is having are these huge um, and very also life-changing economic impacts that so many are feeling. Um, Congresswoman Spirit, could you talk a little bit about what leaders are looking at in terms of indicators to see um, the potential recession, the recession that we might already be in right now, um, and how we how interventions can help by uh, help by shortening or um, you know softening that potential recession that we can see. The most important thing we can do is get people back to work, and the, the only way we're going to be able to do that is by comprehensive testing and contact tracing. So this has got to be a all of government effort. It has to, uh, re it requires us frankly to uh, exercise the Defense Production Act in such a way that we maximize the testing, not just the swabs, and that we start testing as many as a million people a week. That means hundreds of thousands of people are gonna be are necessarily going to be trained to go out and do the contact tracing um, so that we can reopen our economy. Short of that, we are going to find ourselves in a perpetual uh, cycle of hot spots being created around the country. 
So uh, you look at Germany, they have done a, a very good job in a very short period of time. And uh, if we've got to take a lesson from another country, so be it. Uh, but we have failed in doing um, the job. And it cannot be left to the states. It has to be a national effort. And so many of us are very focused on that right now. Absolutely. And so given that fear that we're living in, I want to turn it back over to Julie. Um, so even when the stay at home measures are lifted, um, a lot of the public is going to be scared, isn't going to feel safe going out, um, you know, revitalizing businesses, going to their favorite restaurants. Um, there's going to be a long period of, of fear that we're still going to live in. And so can you speak a little bit about the resiliency of small businesses? Do they, are they strong enough to withstand um, the number of months, uh, possibly years to come? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's one of, you know, the few situations, or actually the only situation that I can think of where we don't have a specific end date. You know, usually if SBA comes in and responds to a disaster, you have a start date and you have an end date and you, you're doing, you know, you're in full on recovery mode and you kind of know what that looks like. Here, we don't. Um, we have a lot of unknowns. So I think the conversations we're having with businesses is going to keep evolving over time. I think right now we're still heavily in support mode and trying to make sure, I mean, everybody's very focused on financial assistance. How do I survive? It's, you know, mm -hmm. how do I get to whatever this next level is going to be? But I have had started having conversations with some of our you know, resource partners and some of the other organizations like different chambers and like, what else do we need to do? How is this conversation going to change? I mean, the one, the one thing that, you know, I love about small businesses is that they are, can be more adaptable and readily to change and they're creative and they're innovative. I mean, I've already seen some really creative things that people are doing right now to try to, you know, create a new revenue stream or even just support their community, right? I mean, the, I, I, I'm constantly just amazed and inspired by some of the businesses I've been talking to that even in their darkest hour as a business owner, they're still looking at their community and saying, oh, there are people worse off than me and what else can I do to support them? And, and some of their efforts have led to new revenue um, streams for them so they can keep people employed. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to see some more innovation and we've got all these business advisors available that have a lot of different areas of expertise um, that I think we're going to be having more conversations saying, well, how else can we support the businesses? What kind of educational support do we need or how do we work with them to either pivot their business into something else or just to take precautions, the different precautions from our healthcare uh, community as those evolve and are made known to us. So I think it's it's going to continue to evolve, and I think our resource partners, especially, stand really ready to help the business community through all these evolutions. Julie, yeah. can you um, answer this question for me? Knowing what you know now, having uh, been through the first phase and now into the second, um, what would you have Congress do differently, or what would you have Congress add to the existing legislation? Hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, loaded question. <laughs> um, that is a really good question. I think, I think part of the the issue is that we, as as SBA, if you know, if we were to be the delivery mechanism, like we have been, you know, what kind of looking closely at the infrastructure we have and how we've been set up and how our programs operate, is there a good or a better way to deliver? Uh, assistance, financial assistance specifically to the small business community and um, you know I'm not I'm not certain there is you know I've had a lot of people tell me like why aren't you doing grants why aren't you just doing direct and as an agency outside of the disaster program you know we haven't done any direct lending since I think the late 1980s uh, was the last time so we don't have the infrastructure to quickly go and deliver it, which is why I think the, the using the guaranteed loan program in that way uh, with the PPP was probably the fastest way to get money out the door. Um, I mean, I think there's a, 
a dynamic that I'm not sure how you solve because uh, there's a lot of legal issues that come into play that is probably beyond the scope of this webinar uh, as to how you know the the resource partners deliver some of these programs and what we what we could legally do or not do as a way to create um, guidelines as or parameters around how it's delivered but um, yeah it's a it's an interesting question. Um, I guess I, I wish I had had the luxury of having a, a great solution to offer off the top of my head, but I do think there are some lessons learned and I'm certainly happy to even, you know, talk further um, offline too. Okay. Uh, Cause I think it's, I think there's a lot of different factors, but again, again, there's a lot of laws that play into this and a lot of other factors such as bank regulators and their rules and other things that overlay on top of it all. And, um, with my um, experience in NSBA, um, even in my time in headquarters and knowing how those, all those regulations and rules play, interplay, it's not a, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy task, <laughs> that's for sure. So um, early on, and I don't know if that's still going on, unless you had a pre-existing relationship with the bank, they weren't willing to even take your application. And if you did have a pre-existing relationship, many were asking you, to get a business credit card or some other uh, upselling was going on is how I refer to it. Uh, there was no restriction on that, I presume, and that has not, there has been no guidance provided on that? Uh, correct, there's nothing, um, there's nothing that's existed in, in the SBA's um, 7A regulations. Um, so the, you know, my understanding is how this is operating is we take our basic 7A program, which is our government guaranteed lending program, and then the CARES Act was kind of overlaid on top of it. Um, the CARES Act kind of changed some of the rules, it waived some, it expanded some other rules, for example, allowing nonprofits to become eligible. So when you put those two together, between the two of them, you're correct. There were no, there was no explicit restriction or um, guidance on you know, whether a bank uh, can limit the amount of, or the, the people who apply, or, or do these other tactics, like you've mentioned, like the upselling and other things. But maybe that's a failing of Congress, because for the banks to impose these restrictions, it's not their money, it's the taxpayer's money. And so putting any kind of restrictions or requiring a, additional, um, products to buy should not be something that should be allowed when it's not their money. So I, I think part of the, the other equation or other party, I think that would be really interesting to add to this conversation is the, the federal regulating bodies for the banks, whether it's through the Fed, through the OCC or some others, because because of I, I'm certainly not an expert on bank regulations by any stretch, I won't pretend to be, but how, how do we expand a program like this um, very quickly, given the regulations the banks are operating under? And I, you know, we did see the Fed, I think it was over a week and a half ago, step up to provide additional financing support, especially for some smaller banks, so that they would have, be able to potentially lend more and stay within the right ratios against whatever internal business assets they're lending against, so that they wouldn't, they would still be adhering to the good business practices that they're required to do for their regulators, but also create hopefully more money and more resources to put out on the street. So that's a, that is a, a group that in my opinion that probably would um, add a lot of value to this conversation as well. Thank you. Great, I want to um, ask a question from our audience from Jim Ellis. Um, what percent of approved applications for PPP are proceeding ahead with loan funding? Julie, do you know the answer to that off the top of your head? Uh, the percentage that are proceeding, was that under this current? Uh, well, from okay. SBA's perspective, the only loans that we see that hit our system are the ones that are approved. So how many are in each bank's pipeline is not something I would have uh, information on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the 
the loans coming in um, to our system are the ones that are already approved. Because in this case, remember, we gave the banks what we call delegated authority. So the banks actually make the lending decision on whether to approve or, or deny for any reason. Um, and hopefully they're telling the borrower what that reason is if there is a denial. But um, so we only have the data on the approvals. Um, and so from the first iteration, you know, uh, it was uh, over 1.6 million um, loans, or obviously the, three, the total at that time, at least was 349 billion, as we've seen with some of the um, businesses giving their money back, or some loans that just businesses ended up declining too uh, at the end of the day. So there'll be more money that is put back into this pot um, from that triage too. But as of yesterday, like I said, about 3.30 p.m. is when I saw the data that was 100,000 loans um, through, through about 4,000 different lenders right now. Mm -hmm. So Julie, how do we make sure that there's not discrimination going on then if you don't see those who apply but don't get funded? Uh, well, we're, you know, relying, I guess, on our banks with their follow the good business practices and that the rules that they're obligated to follow per their bank regulators, which prohibit discrimination against any borrower for that is eligible, you know, for any reason. There are, there are certain industries which are not eligible, uh, but those are, uh, you know, there aren't that many. But other than that, um, we, we hope that the banks are following the, the practices that they're obligated to follow in this regard. Can you, can you speak to, we, we broadened those that could participate in this program, and could you speak to those, the uh, minority banks, the women-owned banks, the uh, credit unions, the, um, ID, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the actual initials, IDFCs. Um, yeah. So we, yeah, we've been ex um, trying to onboard additional lenders. We had a bunch of those uh, smaller banks and, and um, credit unions that already did participate, but we, that's the largest group that we've seen um, as we onboard new banks, a lot of credit unions. In fact, just this week, I had two new credit unions in this area uh, be approved for the program. So that's one of the largest groups in addition to, um, um, some of the uh, non-traditional lenders, if you will, or the CDFIs and others. So together with all of these resources, yeah, we're able, they are able to in headquarters by the size of the, you know, the type of bank and the size of the bank, be able to track the 60 billion that was set aside or carved out uh, for the smaller um, asset-based banks and um, organizations to make sure that there are, uh, that they're having, um, they won't have any trouble accessing at least a certain um, portion of the money. Um, but as we have seen from the data from the first one, they actually, in some regards, had more success than some of the bigger banks actually getting funding for their, their applicants. So I, I expect, I hope, I hope that trend continues. <laughs> Could you define what a CDFI is? Uh, community development, let me get this right, financial Finance. institution, yeah. <laughs> They're, um, designated by treasury and they typically uh, are non-traditional bank lenders that can that lend to um it could be a certain ge geographic area a certain constituency base um, they typically uh, are there to support uh, people who are or businesses or individuals who do, are not getting traditional access to funding and a lot of the CDFIs also had already participated with SBA's programs through our micro lending programs and our community advantage programs. So, we're, so we're if, people, if people were interested in trying to access a CDFI, how would they find them on your website? Uh, they can start with what's in our lenders list. And then what I've um, also created for Northern California is a list of all of the banks that we could confirm. Um, are participating in PPP because that list can vary slightly from the banks who are already authorized to just do our normal lending. So on that list, people will see that. It also includes the fintech lenders and some of the newer organizations that um, are going to do some lending as well. Um, it does update regularly, so the best way to do it is to, to email us, um, our SFO mail at sba.gov. 
and we can provide you with that list if you don't already have it. Um, it's kind of augmenting what's already on our website and try, trying to keep it up to date uh, with information as, as soon as I know it, whether a bank is added or whether a bank drops off or trying to keep it as up to date as possible. Now, Wells Fargo was restricted in how many loans it could um, issue in the first tranche. Is that the case as well in the second one? I believe the regulators did work with the bank and they were able to uh, raise the, their, their lending cap, but I'm not sure to, wh how, to what extent it was raised. But I know that they're continuing to do lending, uh, okay. but I don't know if they have a new cap or if it's been uh, lifted altogether right now. I'd have to confirm that with the, with the bank. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to call out um, one of our Bay Area Council members, Jonica Clem from TechCU, who wants to thank you both for the um, carve out um, for credit union and community banks. We have been able to help lots of small businesses and nonprofits and look forward to helping more. So a, a good um, feel good story. Um, I'm going to um, ask one final question from Pat Mapelli before closing comments. And it's around K through 12 school districts. Um, public, uh, the public K through 12 school districts in California were underfunded prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. More cuts are planned to the school year for, for next school year. This is our workforce. These are our business leaders and political leaders of the future. What is the funding plan for the K through 12 public schools? Congresswoman? So the federal government is not uh, very engaged just historically in K through 12 funding. That is a responsibility of the states. And as we all know, 40% of all the state revenues are required by initiative to go to the schools. And then it's augmented by appropriations that the state legislature uh, provides. The federal government's responsible for uh, funding about 40% of what's called IDEA, which is the funding for special education. And we've done a lousy job on that. Uh, we're supposed to do 40% and it tends to be less than that from year to year. Um, and the efforts by this particular administration is to starve many education programs generally. So in terms of K through 12 education, I, I think the, the, the teachers are doing a remarkable job right now under very strange circumstances. I did a, a Zoom call with uh, local school superintendents and what, I walked away with was an understanding that we are expecting so much from the teachers and so much from the parents because all of a sudden parents are becoming homeschoolers um, and educators and that the biggest issue we will have and there will be I think repercussions of this is that low-income children children with special needs are going to be hurt the most by this distant learning um, scenario. So the extent to which we can get kids back in the classroom um, is really critical, but we have to do it um, with a comprehensive testing program in place because while children do not seem to be getting ill from COVID-19, um, they can in fact be carriers and take it home to older uh, family members and before you know it, we have a situation much like we do in the nursing homes where um, oftentimes it was the workers going from one nursing home to the next that was transferring the uh, infection or the virus, I should say, um, from one facility to the next. Um, so unfortunately, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. So we only have a, a couple more minutes left. And so I want to turn it back to you both for any closing comments you have for our members and please let us know how the Bay Area Council can help move anything along that you all are working on. Um, Julie, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I just want to say that if you um, want a great, you know, shout out to some of our resource partners. And if you haven't tapped into them yet, and you're, especially if you're in a situation where you're trying to maybe find a new lender for PPP, or you're still trying to figure out if when Idle reopens, is that a right program fit for you? 
please tap into the, those resource partners. Um, they're free and they're really great at helping you uh, answer your questions and then also maybe finding you know, new resources, whether they be lenders or other um, community partners to support your business right now. Thank you. And thank you so much for your leadership, helping small businesses. It's really incredible. Thank you. Congresswoman. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Julie, I want to say thank you again for, for joining in this conversation. Um, I think you represent um, the best the federal government has to offer in terms of being accessible as a public servant. So uh, thank you again. And um, to all of you who have been on the call to the leadership of the Bay Area Council to you, Rochelle. Um, it's been uh, a privilege really to assist in bringing you this program today. Um, know that you can contact me um, whenever you have questions and I'll do my best to respond as swiftly as possible. These are unprecedented times. Um, we are doing this um, as swiftly as we can under uh, what are dramatically um, challenging environments. And we don't have it all right. So we're gonna to have to continue to work together to find the perfect solution. But I hope you'll join with me in uh, urging our leadership throughout the country um, to maximize the testing that's going on. UCSF has embarked on a very uh, aggressive program and starting in the Mission District to do the contact um, uh, tracing and um, to try and be more comprehensive in terms of testing. But that's gonna be the secret to the economy rebounding, uh, along with the SBA's efforts. So thank you again. Thank you so much for your leadership, Congresswoman Spear. Um, and yes, we 100% agree with you on the testing. We are working with our global partners on trying to secure plenty of tests for California. And we're happy to update um, the group on that when there's more information on that. Thank you all for tuning in for today's webinar. This Thursday at 11 a.m., we have another webinar um, with Janet Napolitano, the University of California president. Um, so we're really thrilled to be having her, and thank you again for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.